So let's start our second round table with PhD holders now working outside of academia. And I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, on this table uh, Dr. Luca Polacki, advanced research, research engineer at L'Oreal, Dr. Sophie Tira, application engineer and Agilent Technologies Italia, Dr. Alan Perotti, artificial intelligence data scientist and sent IE. And Dr. Simone Benedetto, head of UX Research at Jacala, and Dr. Edith Gerval, head of the internal, internal Communication Unit at International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. So um, the same principle, there's a um, short introduction from each of speakers, then we will take some of questions, and in the end, you can also, of course, complete uh, with more questions. So we will uh, follow in the order as it's mentioned on the program, and we will start with Luca. I just have to push. Okay, you can hear me. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Christina, for the invitation here. Um, I'm going to try to be uh, as quick as possible to tell you a bit my story. Uh, so my story starts here, actually, in Turin, um, and where I did my bachelor in chemistry. Um, after that, I, um, I went to the UK to work in a biomedical company as a technician because I just wanted to travel a bit and discover a bit what was out there and to see how the working life was. Um, I quickly realized that uh, the work of a technician wasn't really what I wanted to do and I wanted to pursue my studies, but still uh, being able to travel. So I did a master's degree uh, in uh, Erasmus Mundus project uh, between France, Portugal and Italy in uh, physical chemistry of materials. Um, then I, uh, I was very convinced that I really wanted to be a researcher, actually, and I still am. Um, so I decided to undertake a PhD degree, uh, and I did it in Paris uh, in physical chemistry of uh, new materials. Uh, and it was a great experience uh, that led me actually to pursue in academia with a postdoc. Um, this was, was the moment when <laughs> everything changed. Um, it was actually on paper the best project in the world. Uh, I was working with color chemistry in fossils uh, in collaboration with the Natural History Museum. Uh, so if you know uh, the TV series Friends, I was really feeling like Ross Geller uh, going to work uh, in a Natural History Museum. It was great. Uh, but I really uh, realized that um, since I was new in the in the topic, because um, I wasn't in cultural heritage before, um, I was really lacking some management. My boss was never there. He was always busy. He was never uh, following me uh, in anything I, I did. Um, which now, back then, it seemed horrible. Now I, I, I learned a lot from, from, from that because I had to do everything by myself, uh, planning of experiments, recruiting um, uh, interns, uh, explaining uh, how the lab was working to other users because he was literally never there. And that's also the moment when I really started questioning, uh, do I really want to stay in academia? Is it... Uh, the best fit for me? Do I really want to produce new knowledge and publish paper all my life and maybe teach? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, that's when a uh, big reflection started and when I met uh, ABG uh, Association, uh, Association Bernard Gregory, and we started to actually work on my profile and to, um, to really um, uh, understand where my skills were in terms of technical skills and soft skills. What is great about research, no matter in which field, uh, you will get a bunch of technical skills which are very important and will, of course, orient your, uh, uh, your job search. But what is most great experience is that you get um, 
amazing soft skills because doing bibliography is not just reading papers it's getting critical thinking uh, it's building really um, an idea about what you read and to be critical uh, towards uh, others other people works um, can I do it better what it is lacking it's really uh, much more than that Teaching, I, I used to teach, I taught for uh, three, four years, and uh, it was a great experience. It helped me a lot in communication skills, in being clear in what I want to say, have some clear message that I, that I want to convey. And this was also a, a great um, experience that, uh, that really gave me much more than what uh, people would think it gives. And um, in my job search, the, the real game changer was the participation to a, to a career fair. Um, I had met already uh, the ABG, ABG uh, Association, so I had my CV ready, I had my pitch, uh, so I was quite ready for it. And I went to the stand of L'Oreal. Uh, of course, I knew the company. I did some search before because I knew uh, they would be there and I knew that they have a massive um, R&D department, which was my aim. And I get to the stand. Uh, there is the HR. Uh, we started talking. Then I have a look at the table and I see a pile of CVs like this. I was like, um, OK, I have like <laughs> zero possibility, zero chance. And I said to myself, I have to really stand out by pitching myself so then he will remember me. So I just started to talk and uh, to pitch myself and really clearly tell what I want to do. I told him I, I want to have an impact on consumers. I want to work on real products. I'm a chemist. I have this to offer. I know microscopy. I know many things, technical things. I want to evolve in this uh, career project. Um, so three months later, I see a position that opens up uh, and uh, on LinkedIn, I start my uh, application. I was super long. You have to give your CV and then you have to fill all the forms like individually. And I said, OK, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> like not tonight. So I just push it for another day. And three days after, the same HR that I saw at the career fair called me to say, oh, a position open, and I think you have the good profile for it. Uh, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm interested. So that's how it started. And uh, now it's been one year and a half that I work there as an advanced research engineer. So I still have um, a lot of um, technical, um, technical tasks in my job. Uh, as a chemist, I go to the lab. Uh, not every day, much less than before, but this was also the aim. So I, I would say that it's a perfect um, equilibrium between project management and, and laboratory work. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. If you have any questions about my daily um, tasks or whatever, uh, be free and, and just ask. Thank you, Luca, for your Testimony, um, do we have questions? Can you bring the mic, please, Lucio? <laughs> I'm arriving. Let's do it properly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, for telling us your story. So I wanted to ask about the pitch. So how do you... Uh, make the perfect pitch uh, you said you had help from the abg abg uh what, what's what's your suggestion on how to um deliver yourself in the best way possible okay yeah well first you have to train a lot <laughs> you have to try many things and the first thing to do it's not actually preparing the pitch but preparing your profile who do you want to be as a professional? What do you feel like doing? What motivates you? This is the first question that you have to ask to yourself and compare that to what the job market offers, basically. I, I was looking for something still technical, still in the lab, but with some project management tasks. And uh, that's how I, I basically pitched myself. Uh, I want to work in a big company. L'Oreal is a big company. 
um, I'm a chemist, I have these skills, these technical skills. Then you have to also show that you know the company. So I had the chance to meet some uh, professors that collaborated with some uh, research groups in L'Oréal. Uh, so I mentioned a couple of names that I remember, a couple of techniques that they were using, and I said I could do this and I could make it better, basically. Um, what you have to keep in mind is to give one, maximum two big messages. I wanted to work with microscopes or, and spectroscopy. Well, this is very technical, but that's what I said. Like I have a sort of optician profile, optical engineer. And that's what he remembered when he saw the, the HR, when he saw the, the position opening as a optical engineer, he called me because I said the keywords that I was looking for. Another question? I have a, a little quick question. So you mentioned that um, it was a recruiter who has contact you. How did you maintain the contact with this person, if anyhow? Uh, I add, we added each other on LinkedIn. Uh, so also this is a, a very um, important advice that I have to give to everyone. Be present uh, on LinkedIn, on every uh, social media and contact people, like talk to people. Uh, try to find people that have similar, uh, similar jobs to, to what you would like to do and ask them, how, how is it? How did you get there? Why? Uh, uh, what should I do uh, to get there? And people are usually nice. Uh, they usually respond. So <laughs> I, I do a lot. I receive many, many messages now and I, and I, and I try to help as much as I can. Uh, but with this specific person, I, I added him on LinkedIn and uh, I was liking his posts and um, I sent maybe a couple of messages saying, if you ever have a position in optical engineering or uh, well, the, the, the positions that I, that I was looking for, let me know. And that's also how he probably remembered me when the position opened. Thank you. Please give a, a round of applause for Luca. And let's move to our second um, speaker, Sophie. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Sophie. Um, I'm an analytical chemist. I have a PhD in chemistry, so quite similar with uh, Luca. Um, but on the contrary, I'm from France and I work in Italy. So, um, so I started my PhD in chemistry in Paris, in France. Um, I was also working in the field of uh, cultural heritage. So I'm curious about uh, your boss that was never there. So maybe I know, <laughs> maybe I know him. <laughs> and um, uh, afterward, I started a postdoc, um, which was a collaboration between a startup and the University of Lille in the north of France. And that was also a good way to be um, a bit in the academia and a bit working with a company. And that was also a good way to choose uh, uh, if you're hesitating, if you want to stay in academia, if you want to move. Um, this kind of startup hosted by the university can be um, a good way to have a vision of boss. Um, and uh, then afterwards, I chose to move to Italy for personal reasons. And uh, I was mainly looking in the field of industry um, because, as you know, it's quite difficult to look for a job in academia if you don't have the contacts. So if, if it's another country, it can be very difficult. And I was also a bit tired of having one year contracts, always innovating. So that was the, um, the reason for which I, I choose to go definitely um, in the industry of words. World, and I found a job uh, in a pharmaceutical company in Milano. Um, in, in this case, and also in the for my next change, um, I 
I um, use LinkedIn a lot um, and I was contacted by a recruiting company like, you know, ADECO or something like that for a position that actually uh, I, I didn't get in the first place, but I maintained contact with these recruiters uh, and then for other positions they contacted me. So for me, it never worked putting my CV on a website. Uh, <laughs> I just, I went with LinkedIn and with uh, contacting and keeping in touch with uh, this um, recruitment company and actually I found uh, that they can be really helpful if you're honest with them and you tell what do you like, what do you want. They will also, if they have a position, think of you and try to, to propose something that um, match your what, what you want. Um, of course, you have to know how to, to present yourself and to pitch yourself to, to give them a, a positive impression in the first place. Uh, so I worked for four years in this pharma, pharma company and then I changed uh, one year ago. Now I work for Agile and Technology that you may know or not. They are selling uh, laboratory instruments. Um, and then again, it was also with a recruiting company that I got the job and um, just, yeah, for um, for the story, uh, when I saw the position, I, I applied on the website uh, right away because I was really interested in working for Agilent and then nobody contacted me for like six months. <laughs> and then I think that was just this rate of finding someone, but uh, with this, uh, thanks to this recruiter, I managed to get the, the position. And um, also it's a position for which I wasn't really skilled. So um, yeah, you have to believe in your in your opportunities and uh, know what you, um, uh, yeah, to, to show your soft skills and show your motivation. And then you can also get some position that you don't have the technical competence to deal with. And um, yeah, about having a PhD, uh, I found it quite useful when I was looking for a job abroad. Um, because if you, maybe some, some of you want to maybe to work abroad, to work in England, in Germany, in France, um, especially in Germany, PhD is really, um, uh, important. Uh, so it may be easier for you in these countries to, um, to get the most of your PhD. Um, and in any case, uh, I think you will be in competition with local people and PhD, it's, it's kind of leveling because uh, it's the same in Europe, um, whereas uh, maybe the Laurea in Italia, it's different from the engineering degree in France. So um, at this, if when you have a PhD, you're competing with other PhDs and so you are the same, you are the same level and uh, you can really uh, yeah, um, be, a, I think, a better competitor. So I found it really, really useful. And one last thing about uh, going abroad and maybe living abroad or, or having a period uh, um, outside of Italy, I really, really advise you to do it. I think it's wonderful to live in another country that you learn a lot. Then even if your job is not your dream job, there are so many uh, wonderful things uh, about living in another country that will um, make this experience uh, really, really interesting for you. Um, so, yeah, if you can, do it. <laughs> so, finished, if you have questions. Thank you, Sophie. Do we have questions? A question linked to what you mentioned, um, these cultural differences. There is a cultural differences in the recruitment process between Italy and France that you know. Oh, yes, yes, there is. Um, uh, it's also most depend a lot of the companies, but um, for example, uh, I had to explain a lot of times why I didn't have a master degree with uh, 100 uh, Chantuelo or there or something like that because in France it's completely different. So you have to be prepared <laughs> about this. Also for you Italian, maybe for you, you're really proud of your uh, Chantuelo and, and, and if you go abroad, no one will care. So you have to explain that it's something really good, that it's your achievement. So be prepared that you have to explain all the differences between what you, what was your uh, student um, achievements and, and what they can be abroad. 
Um, and yeah, also lately when I, I applied for Agilent, uh, the company is multinational. So in this kind of company, the type of recruitment, it's really uh, easier, I guess, um, because um, they are used to recruit people from Germany, from France, from Italy, from Spain. So they will ask more or less the same question and they will not focus on uh, your master degree or something like that. So um, also, yeah aim for big companies that can be um, easier to get in. It's strange, but uh, small local companies, they may see you as something a bit strange. <laughs> hmm. Thank you very much. So let's move to our next speaker, Alan Pirotti, please. Hi. Um... Hello, is anyone here from science or technology? Just a show of hands. Okay, so there won't be many nerdy details. Um, so good for the other ones. So um, I'm a computer scientist. I studied here. I wanted to do AI since I was a kid. Uh, so I've just been very lucky to decide to do that uh, at that time. So um, in a nutshell, what I did was uh, academia up to the PhD, then unemployment, then data science, then research in a private sector. Right now I'm working as a researcher at Chentai, which is a research center. We are in the uh, Intesa San Paolo skyscraper physically. So, so what I'm doing actually is pretty much the same thing that I would have wanted to do in the university. Um, I think that for you guys, the most interesting bit of this whole arc of story is the un unemployment bit. <laughs> right after the the PhD. So during the PhD, I was so obsessed, so focused on, on my thesis that I didn't think about what I wanted to do after that. I mean, there was nothing after the PhD thesis. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wasn't sure I was going to survive the PhD, so I didn't make any plan for after that. <laughs> so like the earth was flat. <laughs> <laughs> nothing after that. Um, so I decided to leave the academia after I, I got my PhD, actually. Um, and I decided to try and do data science um, because it was becoming a thing back in the day. Now, of course, of course it is. Um, and I really wanted to be in Turin because I'm from around here. I think the quality of life in Turin is amazing. So I really, really wanted to do science here. Uh, whereas, of course, in, for this kind of, of, of jobs, it's really easy to, to go outside, to go abroad in Switzerland or the UK or US and be paid a lot, way more than how much you can be paid in Turin, be aware. Um, but the quality of life, in my personal opinion, is uncomparable. We have the mountains. How, how can you beat that? So um, right after the PhD, what I did was to study. So getting a job was a full-time job for me and of course i was not getting paid to do any of that so now now the, this is the the nerdy technical bits but um, i needed to learn a new programming language because my phd was in java and matlab this is how old i am I, i've been doing neural networks before tensorflow was a thing <laughs> um so i had to learn python that i didn't know about um i need to learn needed to learn some stats i needed to know all the things that are not part of my background um and I did that, I mean, as a job, like 9, 9, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for several months before I started applying to jobs. So that's the, the, the first bit. I really, I, I, I decided to do that and I was like, okay, what do I need in order to? Um, so after a few months, I started applying for jobs um, and I applied for jobs for a few months doing uh, interviews and such. Um, and at the end of the day, whole, the whole thing took about nine to 10 months. So it, it was quite a bit. Um, and I remember I had a, a, an Excel spreadsheet of companies that had contacted. And I sincerely, I'm not making this up. I think that the number of companies that I contacted for my first job was about 200. Seriously. Uh, I think it would be different nowadays because data science is more of a thing. Of course, everybody's doing AI right now, but we we're, were talking quite a bit far ago. So uh, AI wasn't much a, a thing as it is today. Um, 
So first message, I, I really needed to study for the job that I had. And of course, I was going to leverage what I had in my background with the PhD. But of course, I was missing something. So I had to complement that. Second thing is, of course, perseverance, because it, 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 you, need, you need to embrace failure. And I, I know this sounds corny and cliche, but you get rejected so much. So many companies don't reply you. You get discarded so many times. So just accept it. It gets better, it gets easier. The, the hard bit is to get in uh, the, 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 the job market. Once you're in, everything is easier. But the first step is really, really hard, and you just need to endure that. Uh, and I second that I used LinkedIn a lot and there is no shame in promoting yourself on LinkedIn. So contact everyone. Worst case, they won't answer you. Uh, but sometimes someone will be kind and give you some pointers. Um, so I had a student of, of computer science uh, texting me a few weeks ago. He didn't know me. He was like, look, I want to do what you do. What should I study? What should I do? Should I be here? Should I go abroad? So we chatted a little bit. And this is the kind of approach that I encourage you to have. It, it's likely that many people won't answer you. It doesn't matter. I mean, you have nothing to lose in being a, a bit insisting in, in LinkedIn. So that, that's pretty much it. So I used LinkedIn a lot, and I actually found my job on Monster. Monster is a job website. I don't even know whether that exists. Is it still on? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I mean... Even after the PhD, getting a job was really hard. But once you're in, you start knowing people, start cooperating, cooperating with people. And at that point, the networking aspect really becomes paramount because you start working with different companies. You go to events, you have a business card, you talk to people, and it gets way easier because you can, you can do that while having a job and while having a salary. So I think this is really, really important. And well, concerning the last bits, as I mentioned before, I really wanted to do research and what I do right now is research. Um, so, of course, I couldn't I couldn't do that without without my PhD. So even though the technology evolved since such a such a fast pace, it's really hard to uh, to 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 keep the same pace as, uh, as it does. Um, I couldn't do anything that I do right now without the PhD. So, I, I mean, I, I think I managed. And of course, AI is a bit of a weird thing because it's really in fashion right now. But I wouldn't be able to do the job that I do right now without the PhD. But at the same time, I'm super happy that I can do research outside of academia, which it's not necessarily a very easy thing to, to do. I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you, Alan. Yes, we have a question, Lucia, just behind you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. So when you first started, you said you contacted about 200 companies or position. Did you personalize all those single 200 application and uh, I mean, because they say it's very important to personalize the application when you start to apply to position. So, uh, was did you do that? No. Uh, I didn't personalize the CV, uh, except for you know the very big companies. Uh, but I did personalize the email whenever that was possible. Uh, so I'm not a huge fan of cover letters because, in in my opinion, in in the CV you have the facts. In the cover letters, you have the fiction, so it's like, yeah, this kind of stuff. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I tried to do some research. So it's like, I want to work for that company. What do they do? What do I have in my background that feeds their possible goals? So yeah, I, I tried to do that. It's likely that I didn't do a great job at that since I got so many rejections, but at least I tried. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's not a... That's not a pointless uh, suggestion, in, in my opinion, to try and be, look, there is something, some possible overlap between what you company are looking for and what I candidate have to offer. So what I would recommend, because I work for the United Nations and we have terms of references in the job applications, you have the job description is sometimes just as long as your dissertation. So what I suggest is that you ask ChatGPT to turn it into a cover letter, like make me a cover letter that fits this profile. 
and you will have like the standard letter that you are expected and then you personalize it with your own experience but that's what i do i'll say the same thing i, I was a bit before chat gpt <laughs> <laughs> just try with uh, ai you know like <laughs> But it's true also that you just have to get out there and not be scared of rejections because it's it's part of the process. And I wanted to stress this point because I kind of had the same experience. 60 companies in my Excel file, I got into one. So, <laughs> What does your research experience bring to you now in your uh, new position as a researcher. You are, you are an example of uh, research outside academia, so you can however, so be, carry out research, but what does your PhD? Oh, I, I, I'm pretty much doing the same thing that I would do in academia research-wise. So, of course, I, I, I needed to learn so many new stuff, and especially in AI, I mean, everything that was state-of-the-art last year is pointless right now, so you need to learn to keep up a lot, but how to write a paper, how to quickly read and understand a, a paper, how to write a grant proposal, it's all stuff that I've learned during the PhD. So, I mean, in my case, it's fairly simple because I'm doing, I'm, most of the times I'm doing research, but it's exactly all the methodologies that I've learned during the PhD. So, <laughs> everything. Thank you very much. What is your key message, your final key message in, in, a, in a very few words? I guess the final message is that it, it really depends on what is your, your domain. You really need to understand your domain and, and, and the possibilities that you have outside of academia in your very specific uh, area of expertise. Because at the end of your PhD, you're the paramount word expert on something super specific, uh, but it, it, it varies a lot. For, of course, what, what I've been through uh, would not apply to someone who has a PhD in philosophy, for instance. So talk to people that did the same thing in your specific field, because I can, I can, I mean, we can give you very broad and general uh, suggestions, but write your own story. Thank you. And let's move to our next speaker, Simone Benedetto, please. Yeah. So I would also suggest to talk to other people, because if you keep staying with your similars, it's a big mess, you know. You have to get contaminated with other people coming from other backgrounds. So uh, it's very important to share your experience with people that normally, I don't know, at your age probably already work in a company. Um, so I would start like saying that probably the right thing to, say, to, to, to do right now is to add us on LinkedIn, you know, like probably this could boost a little bit your, uh, your, your chance for the future. You know, you never know, you know, like uh, I was there at the conference and uh, I met you. Okay, could be a nice uh, point to start. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm the older year. I don't know, probably. I'm 41. I'm for, I don't look like, yeah, I'm, I'm 41, almost 42. Uh, Do I'm you use L'Oreal product? I don't know. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Is the sufferance of the of the PhD probably you know like <laughs> so uh, yeah I, I'm a product of the University of Turing uh, I, I did my bachelor of science um, um, in communication science uh, back in the early uh, two thousand then uh, a master of science in information communication technologies in which I found the, the subject that I really loved, that was ergonomics, human factors and ergonomics. Uh, and then uh, I said, okay, I want to do a PhD regarding this. So I, so I started to look for a PhD and there was like this, this offer from the University of Turing, the Department of Psychology. And then I decided to, to grab the opportunity and uh, three wonderful years uh um half of them i was in california so i also took the advantage of uh, the opportunity to 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 spend the half of the time in california and this, this this was great i kind of learned a language kind of 
um, and then after uh, after that period, I was uh, I said, okay, I want to learn another language, so I moved to France, <laughs> and I did like uh, four years there uh, for my postdoc, and then at a certain point, I said, mm. in in Italy, I already like smell like mm, a lack of opportunities. In France, I smell the same, so I said, I'm gonna use this huge background that I that I have uh, huge at that time uh, to to work for a company so at the same time after this four year in Paris uh, my, my my I become a father and I decided to move back to Italy and at that point was the worst choice I could have made because I <laughs> yeah I was uh, unemployed for one year and like trying to talk to people about what I was doing. I was like, yeah, you know, like user experience, uh, the design, the interfaces, and people were like, we don't need this, you know, like, and today I'm the head of a department, you know, like uh, eight years later. So the, the words move fast. So keep this in mind, you know, like I see you, you, you have to know that, uh, what actually we are we are talking about today tomorrow probably is not even valuable anymore. You know, like the words the word is 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 is, is, a, is moving fast. So um, after one year, struggling, 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 I found a job that was so I was in Turing and I had to move to Treviso because they in, in that place there was like a very funny guy that was like. Uh, Please help me. I want to bring to the market this service, which combines uh, basically psychophysiology, uh, classical, uh, qu qu qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, technique for uh, measuring the human behavior into the design process. And I said, okay, I come here. Uh, I will come there. And I, and I went there to, with my family. And in the meanwhile, I was having offers, job offers from abroad, like from Google, from Facebook, and I also passed the uh, the interviews. But at the, at the end, you know, like I was there, I decided to move back to Italy. I say I wanna I wanna stay there. Uh, and after four years, I, I decided to to change again. And uh, in this moment uh, of my life, I, I was already old, and uh, they asked me to. Uh, to basically replicate what I brought to this uh, um, place in, in Treviso, uh, the same thing, but in a bigger company with like an other, you know, clients, bigger clients uh, and bigger opportunities for me and the people that work with me. So uh, long story short, uh, that's the, that's it. And what I can suggest you guys, you, you normally um, face a very complex thing in your everyday life. And this is what is going to give you like a, a competitive advantage, advantage uh, when you're going to be on the market. Okay, don't consider the market as we said today, like as a ugly thing. The, the market is you, it's us, you know, like. So, but the fact that you're facing complex thing at the end is going to help you to solve uh, easy things, you know, you will have the energy to, um, to cope with these, uh, events of life. Nowadays, I receive a lot of, you know, like emails, a lot of like, blah, 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 help him do this. I want to do that. Like a lot of confusion, a lot of things, but very, very easy for me to solve, you know, and I have to thank my, my, uh, my, my, my PhD path, uh, for that, you know, that's it. Thank you, Simone. You're welcome. Have a question. I have a question. Thank you. Um, what can a psychologist with the, a PhD, uh, like me, <laughs> in neuroscience, in <laughs> offer? Uh, 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 a company in terms of skills, soft and hard, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, okay. Very nice choice. Um, yeah, um, basically, um, I use a lot of psychophysiology during my, uh, during my 
first years of, uh, of work in the smaller company, it was like easier to sell in that environment. Um, moving to a bigger company, this was a little bit tougher for me, even to sell and to explain as a service. But still, I think that there is a lot of opportunity be, uh, behind what you study uh, because uh, uh, companies need data and need uh, even a combination of data. So you work, if you work alone and you bring just your out research output, you don't do, you, you, you don't go nowhere. But if you work in a team with other people that can bring other kind of insights, you know, you bring the quantitative part and the objective part and the other bring the, qual the qualitative and the subjective part, this could be, could enrich the output that is basically what companies, companies are looking at, you know? So uh, it always depends on what, uh, on what you want to bring. So, I mean, like, I, I don't know the specific of your uh, research domain right now, but uh, at least uh, uh, look for a combination. So look for like, uh, 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 think about combining what you, what's your background with other skill, with other people. So try to find yourself in other, uh, in other environment. Because I think that in, in, the, in, the, in the industry, there is a lot of room for you and people like you in general. <laughs> You're welcome. Do you have another question? How did you market your skills uh, and experience to make you more attractive when you were searching, when, when, when you were in search of your job? I mean, I found my first job after one year of like uh, crazy, you know, like uh, searching for jobs. Um, so I suggest to put LinkedIn alerts that work pretty well and then to try to um, steal uh, information from other people of your same background, but with more experience, you know. And just like I, I always say that like co copy uh, is, is a good exercise. Yeah. Why not? You know, like try inspiration, get inspiration from others. So this, this could be, uh, uh, yeah. Um, then you have to be lucky at the end, you know. A little, a little bit of culo, as we say in Italy, like uh, it's like uh, it's a part of life. Sometimes it goes well, other times like, it goes bad, but it's like this. Yes, last question for Simone. I hope we are not running out of time. Hello, thank you for your talks. Um, in the recruitment session, uh, something that uh, a message that, com that comes to me, it was that we have to be convinced about what we want to do, what we want from that job position, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I think that after a PhD where you study a very specific topic, you are a little bit exploring what the market offers with respect to your skills. So my question to you is that in your jobs research, did you also accept position that you were not so convinced, but maybe you want to do some experience and then change later? Or you search until you find the perfect job for you? I search until I found. Okay. Yeah, I was like very um, convinced about the power of... Uh... Uh, what I've learned till that moment, so I keep just like going, and I have to thank my father because of that, who's not here anymore, but um, he helped me a lot to keep focus on what I was doing, and uh, without you know like uh, um, feeling that it was like a failure for me after one year, like I found a job, and one year for like you know. In that situation was was okay. was really bad you know like but at the end you know like uh um as i was saying i was i was trained to do complex thing and uh this wasn't a, a huge you know effort and even like in terms of like emotion i could have handled it you guys could handle it it was like uh you're tough i think i think that Thank you very much. Let's. I, I just wanted to say, in my case, uh, yeah, I when I came to Italy, I took a job that I wasn't really convinced, and then I turned afterwards. So, it's also a possibility. Depends on your, your also your financial possibilities, and um, 
Yeah, for example, I have a friend of mine, uh, she also has a PhD in biochemistry and after some times of being disoccupied, her father told her, okay, now you get a job or you don't have anything to eat. And so she took a job, she wasn't convinced, um, but then she changed afterward and now she's really happy. So don't be afraid, you can you can change, there is no problem. And, and as Alan said, once you get to fit in, it's really, really easier. So. And also, like, what I was doing was applying to jobs that could possibly interest me, but I didn't know exactly what the job was about. And you, as a professional, I think recruiters see very well if you come with questions, if you want to understand more about the job position. So also use the, the first interview to understand also yourself, could, could I like this? Like, can I can I project myself into this? I, I was very into biochemistry at some point and I was applying to biochemical companies and I did a couple of interviews and I didn't like them at all, finally, you know? I was asking questions and, and I didn't like the approach, I didn't like the company itself and probably also the, the, the topics were not for me and I said okay maybe this I it's not for me I have to put it aside so don't be scared to just get out there and and talk to people also in interviews thank you and let's move to our last speaker Edith Girval please uh, good evening so um well currently I work in the United Nations um, earlier, when Alan was asking who was um, doing their PhDs in science, there were only two people. So I take it a lot of you are in humanities. Is that correct? Can you hear me? Is it better? Okay, so how many of you are working uh, on PhDs in humanities? Only one? Okay. Um, do you think all of you have PhDs that are directly applicable to something on the job market? Not really. So when I uh, was doing my PhD, I did my PhD in something that is considered completely useless for the job market. I am a specialist of 17th century literature and um, the history of science, which means that there's hope for you know anyone. Um, it was not easy. It was actually very difficult, but um, I just want to to give you a bit, you know, of advice on how you can go from, you know, PhD in in English literature of the 17th century to uh, the United Nations, uh, which is uh, unusual. And, and I mean, you guys have a lot for you. Like you have things that are actually useful uh, for, you know, directly useful for a job. I apparently didn't. So. But I knew very early on that I didn't want to continue in academia. I did a PhD and a lot of people do a PhD because they're curious. And if you're curious and you like variety, then uh, academia is probably not a good fit. Um, and you are probably wondering why you would you know, continue doing the same thing for the next 30 years. So I just want to say that there's, um, even if, you know, there was a lot of resistance when I decided to stop. Uh, I did my PhD and I decided to to, to quit, um, to resign from uh, from university and to pursue something else, which at the time didn't really know <laughs> what it was going to be. But um, the idea is that I think if you have been able to achieve a PhD, you're probably capable of doing something else because so just remember this. Uh, people will tell you that, no, that it's another world completely earlier. We heard this, you know, it's a completely different world outside of academia. There's no outside. It's just people who work and, you know, they usually um, manage a project, which means, you know, just having deadlines and managing to hand in your stuff at the right time, which is exactly what you do. Um, or you, you know, communicate, which is ex exactly what you do as well. So you have a number of things that are actually exactly the same. Um, so it's not two different worlds. And I think that's something really important to say. Um, so 
Now, how do you get from one to the other? I think that's really the question uh, that you all want to, to know about. A lot of things have been said by, by all of my uh, colleagues here. I think that the networking is extremely important and it's not just you know going to conferences meeting people it's also asking you know your friends your family is there anyone who works in something else and that i could meet and talk to uh add, you know adding them on linkedin just saying you know i have this interest in you know diplomacy um do you think my profile could fit anything that you know that that there is in your organization or could you introduce me to people that could be interested in my profile. So that's the way you, you go. You start telling everyone that you are looking for something that is different from academia, and it's not a dramatic change. And I want you to start understanding that there's nothing like a dramatic change. There is, I've done a PhD, it has given me a lot of things. It's, it's actually an achievement, and I can achieve other things, and that's fine. Um, the second thing that I would really encourage you to do because it's good for your mental health during PhDs and it's good for your career is to have an activity as a volunteer or as a consultant or anything that you can do on the side but if you want to get into the UN you can start by uh, working for the Red Cross once a week or just volunteering online for the UN it's very easy they have short missions of a few weeks you can do that during the summer to just get your uh, mind off the PhD and do something useful for the rest. Uh, in my case, my student job, uh, I early on, I knew that I was not sure that I wanted to go into academia. And so I applied just about like Alan, I probably sent a hundred CVs uh, with only a master's degree and no qualifications and no jobs. And I ended up receiving on a 13th of July at a time where, when companies are short of staff, a, an answer from a media outlet saying, you know, we need someone to adapt some scripts, some screenplays, uh, are you available? And I said, yes. And that was my student job. That was my, you know, sort of outside of the academia. This ended up being one of the experiences that counted as media experience when I entered the UN. And that got me into a position, uh, you know, at the United Nations Information Center. So, other jobs that I did, I, you know, I worked in, a, in an NGO uh, in the slums of Bogota and I did, you know, because I had done theater and I did um, things like this. So these were sort of the, the side experiences that I had that became the center of, you know, my experience when I applied to something else. And the PhD is just a cherry on the cake, to be honest, when my colleagues don't even know I have a PhD in literature, and it's usually when I say it, it's something, oh, wow, that's fun, that's weird. <laughs> but um, what they don't realize is that, you know, now I'm looked, you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, people look for my skills in terms of, you know, presenting well information. Uh, I'm a really good writer. I'm a really good, you know, I'm really uh, reliable in terms of delivering on time. So. And those things uh, come from the trauma of delivering 500 pages, uh, you know, with a deadline that was very strict. And I think, you know, this is, you're not going to, to say that in an interview, um, but, but really it does add up to your, um, to your skills and your competencies. So um, let me see, I, I have some notes because I thought for a few like, days, what can I tell them to do? Oh, the first thing, yeah, don't be in a rush, like just, Tell yourself that you have an objective like in two, three years time and start building up, you know, the experience and the little things on the side that will become your your main experience to get to something else. Do it progressively. You know, if you're in literature or if you're, I don't know, in history, then start doing something about the history of, you know, um, international, I don't know, international law or something like this. Get into something else. Get into some, sort of side, you know, do side steps and get there progressively. Um, so, you know, volunteer, okay, perfect, I've already said that. Uh, look at what your field, your current field, could have in common with something that, any kind of job that you would like to do. In my case, for instance, I did my PhD on, you know, 17th century literature, etc. but I also, I'm also a specialist of early feminisms, and for that, I had to study all of the, you know, the gender study, sort of, literature that exists on the earth because that's what you do when you do a phd so i'm actually you know qualified also in gender you know and this is something useful for the un so start you know 
you know, writing about things that can be useful, that are sort of on the side of what you're currently doing in your research, but that can be useful for, for, for the future. Um, and then meet people, get recommendations. If you do your volunteer job, get a recommendation. Um, get them to write you a letter and keep it. Um, get them to, you know, keep in touch with people. Um, meet your dad's old friend from university that works in a company that you may like and do that kind of things and keep everybody on LinkedIn. Uh, to be honest, I, I I didn't even have a LinkedIn until recently. And now you know, if I have two, my boss said, oh, I did, you, you need to get one. Um, and actually you do. If you really want a job, it's really good to have a good LinkedIn. Uh, one thing that you should do also is if you work for the UN, go on the UN, you know, on or any other company, but just go on the, the, the websites, the job websites, where you see all the offers. And you don't even look at the, the, the description of the position. You just look at what experience is required, what, you know, how many, you know, what diploma, like, because sometimes maybe you will have to take another master's degree, but after a PhD, it's quite easy. I've done a few of them after the, the PhD. If you need them, you need them, just do them. And, um, but just have a look at what kind of experience and degrees you will need for your, um, for your dream job, for something that could interest you and start doing it and start paving the way. And finally, speak English. If you want to get in, into, you know, in my case in the UN, but I'm pretty sure for, for all of you, it's also something that if you don't speak and write really good English, um, you will probably not stand a chance. And for the UN, in my case, um, if you have a passion for Portuguese, go, go for it, because that can, or for Swahili, like just go for it, because that will be something that can set you apart from the rest of the candidates. Uh, finally, just when you start looking for another job, my, my advice would be go for the jobs that are, you know, temporary, that are at a lower level than, than, than you would expect to get right after a PhD and go for something, you know, even an internship, a paid internship, because that's how you get into, um, you know, the job. don't necessarily look for the, the, the right job right now. Go for something that could, you know, give you, get you entry, because as some of you said as well, once you're there, no one cares the degrees that you have. Uh, if HR accepts your degree, your boss will be okay with it. It doesn't matter. No one is going to ask you your cum laude or whatever, even if you have 10, that's, no one cares. Uh, the PhD doesn't really count anymore often. So what counts is, you know, if you're a person who's nice to work with, who delivers, uh, who has really good qualities. So when you're an intern, if you get an internship, just do your job really well and and you will be contacted again, or you will be recommended and you will get other jobs. So maybe I was too long, I'm sorry. But that's over for me. Thank you, Edith. Questions? Can you tell us, uh, uh, can you tell us something more about your current position? Because uh, international organizations are, are always a fascinating uh, world. What, what kind of positions I've had in the UN? I started in the UN in the field. So um, I started in Colombia. Uh, we covered Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. I started at the United Nations Information Center. So um, it's broadly about information. So we had a radio, a UN radio. That's why the media part for me was, was important and the education part was because, you know, when you're at university, often you teach. So don't forget that this is education and you can actually, you know, this is marketable. You can train people. This is information sharing. This is knowledge sharing and that's important. So um, we worked in Colombia. Um, we did a lot of things, monitoring um, information, you know, because there was a huge amount of migrants from Venezuela. There was political unrest in many of the countries of the area. Uh, and obviously there was a peace process with the farc -EP, So we worked on projects um, of reintegration with ex-combatants, uh, projects with indigenous people, projects with victims of the conflict. Um, and so all of this was sort of the daily bread. Then uh, now I work uh, at HQ, uh, in, in the HQ of an, a UN agency. 
um, where I do internal communications. So this is completely different. And that's also something that I really love about this job is that you can, uh, you know, you're asked to move periodically from three to five years, you know, every three, three to five years you get reassigned and you get a new job in a new country um, with a new language. And so for someone who's very curious, then it's a blessing because you can reinvent yourself and have, you know, the equivalent of you know, the, the amount of learning that you do in a PhD every three years. Uh, so if that's what you are, you know, looking for, something challenging and something that changes all the time. Uh, I think the UN is amazing. So now my job is more political. It's more about you know, managing information internally and you know, managing um, risks and uh, a number of things like this. So, but it also touches on IT because we're, we have you know, next project, I have to redesign a platform for, for, the, for the, an internal platform for the organization. So it is very varied. And the UN in general has millions of different profiles that you could, uh, you know, that you could, uh, you could get. The, the jobs are immensely different. And I had another question. Okay, yes. Uh, mine is not really a question because uh, uh, I want to thank you because I'm doing uh, uh, um, a PhD in history. I'm studying 18th century history. So uh, sometimes I can, I, when I reflect on, uh, on, uh, on my field, I think that my field is not really useful for uh, a company or uh, uh, for the private sector. So uh, I, I sometimes I just uh, uh, see my my path as a, a two ways path: teaching or continuing research in university. And uh, but sometimes I think uh, yes, maybe I don't want to be the maximum expert on my field, uh, uh, on my little field that nobody cares about. And sometimes I think uh, no, I don't want to teach uh, in school. So. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, you can, um, uh, I don't know how to explain, uh, you, can, uh, you can do a, a very interesting job that is related to uh, curiosity, changing uh, and challenging, that is not just uh, a curiosity uh, and challenging in a, a scientific field, uh, is really yeah, it's really nice to, <laughs> to hear and thank you so much for doing That's that. That's why I came here, because I know that when I was in your position about 15 years ago, um, uh, we didn't, two, we were two, my, my friend and I decided that it was not for us. And by the way, if you ask yourselves those questions, you're probably not done for academia. Um, and there was no information. There was like, it was just blank, you know, we, you can teach. You can you can be at university or or you're lost like you're not going to go and the, the flat earth thing is like yeah there's the limit and then we don't know what there is further and i think that's you know just don't be afraid if, you, if, you, if you've managed to be brilliant enough to do a phd you're probably brilliant enough to do anything else that you put your, your mind to um also something that we usually that was a big blocker for me at you know until i just decided it was not I realized that sometimes when you're talented for something, when you're good at something like your PhD or your, you know, academic studies, uh, people tend to think and, and you tend to think that you were made for this, that this is your call, like this is your calling, but you can be talented at many things. And it's not because you're good academically that you are necessarily uh, done for this job, like you, you're, you were not made for this job necessarily. And you can probably do a lot of other things. And I think my current job, it's not research. And that's really something that also is different a bit from, from all of you. Uh, but it's a lot more stimulating intellectually because it's more varied. It's complex problems. And what I really love about the job now that I have is that it has an impact. And I think you will uh, understand this from the humanities point of view. Um, it has an impact, a concrete impact on people. Like it's either building peace or enabling an organization to, to deliver funds to rural populations. It has a sort of, um, you know, a purpose that I needed in my, in, in, in my job and that I didn't get at university. So if you feel that, you know, maybe you should explore, then explore because there is like a, a whole amount, like a huge amount of, of possibilities. Thank you very much, Edith.
Give it a wrap, very deep. Round of applause to conclude. I propose you to continue this discussion during the cocktail. No, just, just to conclude, uh, um, because they were really, they were all really brilliant speakers with so many pieces of advice. Uh, I'm sure that this, your, your speech were really useful and of great help for our PhDs particip participants today. Just, uh, I will ask you just in, in two, three words, uh, your final message to encourage them. Uh... Should I go first? <laughs> um, be motivated. Um, don't be afraid to just get out there and talk to people and um, work on your path and decide who you want to be basically based on what you did. And don't be afraid of changing paths. You can start a job, change it after one year because you don't like it. And so, yeah, you, you can always change. And also the more you try and the more you will figure out what you want to do. My advice would be isolate what you need, what you're lacking in order to get the job that you want and then study it. It's, it's what you can do. Add us on LinkedIn. <laughs> well, I have the final word, I guess. So there's hope. That's it. So, you know, and if you're here, you're probably looking for some hope. So just uh, don't give up. No, sorry, guys, there is a one bit of advice that I wanted to, to tell you and I forgot uh, something that the university is likely not teaching you is how to write a decent CV. And I realized I didn't know how to do that at all. And I learned that during the process. So what I suggest is find someone in your field that is outside of academia that's actually doing the job that you want to do. Go to his or her personal page, find their CVs and copy the format because your first CVs will suck. Right. Mine did so. <laughs> Europass. Yeah, no, 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 Europass. <laughs> no, no, Europass. <laughs> no. Oh, thank you all for your really rich and insightful testimonies. I hope like we will receive a lot of feedbacks. Let's continue the discussion of the official registration because there is we can continue our discussion. We are all invited now to our cocktails uh, downstairs. So thank you so much for uh, for your participation. I'm going to to send you next week. Uh, slide presentation, video recording, and so don't hesitate to write to me if you need uh, some more information. Uh, so, we are... so let's thank the University of Turin, ABG, and the French Italian University for helping us, between well, myself, in the United States. We are grateful to, to the French Italian University for supporting us, uh, the University of Torino, our doctoral school and ABG, uh, make, we're able to make, uh, make possible to organize uh, on, online, on site, uh, this, uh, this event after years of online uh, uh, events. So, and Lucia and Christina as well. The organizer. The organizer.